Bonjour, and welcome to Café with Grace. Nancy Flaherty, founder of Hidden Gems with Grace, has discovered the secrets to shopping in new places like a local, and she's ready to share them with you. She's explored side streets and back rooms to discover the perfect boutique, offering you that item that you will always treasure, your very own hidden gem. She's at the table, eager to tell you about her latest treasure. So grab a cup of coffee or a glass of champagne, and let's hear what she has to say. Coucou, mon chéri, and welcome to another episode of Café with Grace. I'm Nancy, founder of Grace in Paris, and now Hidden Gems with Grace. And I can't wait to tell you all about my hidden gem. But first, I want to thank you for following me on social media, reading my emails, catching my blog, watching YouTube videos that I've made, and just listening to me talk about my favorite subjects. Thanks for hanging with me. Today, I want to talk to you about discovering the archives of Dior. There have been so many fashion museum exhibits of history of fashion houses in the news lately. Um, the Met in New York City always has the Fashion Institute preceded by the Met Gala. Uh, the Chanel exhibit in Paris at the Museum of, of Fashion of course, the Yves Saint Laurent Museum in Paris is such an amazing place to visit with all the archives of Monsieur Laurent, Monsieur Saint Laurent in, um, on exhibit. Here in Atlanta, we have Scad Fash, and they just closed an exhibit about the fashions of Azadina Laya. I can't wait to see what's next at Scad Fash. They always have something incredible. But I want to talk to you today about visiting a museum area that's not open to the public. It's a very private experience, and I was fortunate enough to be invited into this world. I'm talking about the archives of the House of Dior. In 1947, the House of Dior showed what we now know of as the new look, that white, iconic white bar jacket with the full black taffeta skirt. And the photograph that we see, we seem to remember from all of the history of fashion archives is the picture of the woman standing on the bank of the Seine in her beautiful straw hat, twirling and swishing that gorgeous ensemble from Christian Dior. That outfit exists in the archives of Dior. Now, it might not be that exact outfit because I do believe there have been copies made, but I was fortunate enough to be invited by my friends at Dior to go and see these classic pieces and their storage facility. When you're walking along Avenue Montaigne, you notice on the even side of things. Number 30 Avenue Montaigne is Christian Dior. It's the building that Mr. Dior first saw way back in the 1940s and decided that that's where he wanted to build his empire. So to the left and to the right of 30 Avenue Montaigne are more pieces of the Dior family. There's fine jewelry and accessories, leather goods and accessories. Couture is upstairs and ready to wear is in every window. But not many people know that right behind you across the street is a very nondescript doorway. It's got, um, I believe it's a rounded top door. I, I feel like it's green. I didn't take any pictures because I was just so excited to be there. But if I went back today, I could tell you what color that door was. Um, but I stood at that door with such excitement. I was escorted by a friend of a friend who works at the Dior offices in New York City. We waited, we rang the bell and waited and they buzzed us in. So you walk through the front doorway and into a courtyard 
very typical of French architecture. There's a courtyard beyond the wall that you see on the street. We walked into the courtyard and across the way was a glass sided storefront and it was all frosted glass. There was no recognizing signs, no name on it. But you walked up to the door, rang another bell and a security guard opened the door this time. The security guard checked our credentials and let us in. Once we were inside the doorway, I noticed that we were standing in a foyer that floored with a glistening white marble. The walls of the foyer were the classic Dior canage, which for those of you who might not know, canage is the pattern of quilting that you see on that Lady Dior bag. It's got the, the stitching and it's made, it's not just a regular square quilting, it's got um, some geographical shapes to it. But the walls were decorated with this beautiful canage and backlit by just a white glistening glow. Around me to my left, I saw a window case with a mannequin fully outfitted in that classic Dior 1947 new look ensemble. To the right was another glass case with a gorgeous pink taffeta strapless gown from Dior that was fairly recognizable. I can't tell, couldn't tell you exactly what year it was made, but it had the iconic um, bow on the back of it, the classic butt bow that all brides look for. But this was a, a pink cocktail dress, a, a baby pink cocktail dress. Just so beautiful to be in the presence of both of these pieces. The security guard escorted us down the two steps and to a room on the left. This room was where we waited for our tour guide. It, was, it is a library that is full of books and notepads and mementos and things from the House of Dior that I'm sure the designers, I could just imagine the designers like Maria Grazia Churi coming in and saying, oh, get me that book from 1962 that was all about the color green and the archivist just knowing exactly which book she was talking about. Um, this library wasn't a huge room, but it was just full of rows and rows and rows of books. 99% of them were about Dior or written by Dior or someone in the house of Dior. Just, uh, I could have spent days alone in that, in that room. On the side wall was a classic portrait of Mr. Dior. Then I sat down and under, underneath his watchful gaze started to look through some of the books that were offered to me to take a look at. Next to the books were boxes and uh, kind of like an index card box, maybe legal size box, uh, a legal size piece of paper. And if you open the box, inside was a card for each object that's in the archives. So there were probably a good nine or ten boxes, and each box had a different subject or a diff different decade or a different designer. The box that I happened to open up had, was all um, Dior accessories, and I pulled out a card that contained a shoe created by Roger Vivier. Roger Vivier, who is known for the buck, classic buckle shoe today, was gotten was one of the first shoe designers for the House of Christian Dior, and he gained his notoriety through the house. So the shoe picture of the shoe that I pulled out was one of the first shoes that Roger Vivier had made for the House of Dior, and you can see that shoe in the collections that are shown in Ready to Wear today. It's um, just a classic shoe with a strap. It's a uh, strappy heel, a uh, kitten heel, but the, the heel is a little bit curved, so it's very quite classic Roger Vivier for House of Christian Dior. I recognized the boxes, the index card boxes from 
when Maria Grazia Churi first started with the House of Dior, there is a classic picture of her standing at her desk with the windows behind her overlooking Avenue Montaigne. And on her desk are all of these boxes. And she's looking through the boxes for her inspiration. She went back to the archives to build her collection of tomorrow. Uh, which I love. I love that about her, that she brought back some of the classic pieces of Dior with her signature on them. Um, for example, she always comes up with a bar jacket. The bar jacket is that iconic piece with the nipped in waist and the two pockets at the hips, giving a woman that hourglass figure. And this season's collection is actually a knitted bar jacket, which is very interesting because the jacket itself is so corset-like and holds everything in. To have a knitted piece is, is almost shockingly casual for the House of Dior, but that's okay. Um, back to the archives. So while I was in the library, our hostess came in and I was very fortunate to be introduced to this woman. Her name is Swazik Faf, and she is the official archivist for the House of Dior. She knows where everything is, she knows the history of the house, and she can tell you anything you want to know. Um, Swazik took us on this incredible tour of the archives of the House of Dior. We started our tour, of course, in the library where she pulled out some books that were actually written by Christian Dior. One of her favorite examples is a cookbook. He had a personal book, um, almost like a journal, filled with recipes that he had collected over the years, and he loved to cook for his friends. So there was among all of these fashionable, classic research books about fashion and fashion history was Christian Dior's personal cookbook. Very interesting. Um, we took a tour of the library and Swazik showed us all of the books they had in their collection and even a few previews of books that were yet to come. It was just a, a fascinating reference area. After we finished our tour of the library, we went back outside to the foyer where Swazik took us into another room that contained racks and racks of tool, foam rubber, tissue paper, and shelves with boxes. Wondering what this room was, because of course, nothing said Dior or was Dior. They, everything was in black or beige or gray. The workers in there all wore lab coats and white cotton gloves. This, I realized, was the room where the display and the storage boxes were made for all of the pieces. When Dior gets a very delicate piece in, or any, any piece for that matter, um, they need to store it properly so that it will continue to be saved through the ages. And this room is where they create all of the padding, the tool, foundation, undergarments, and the boxes that contain all of the storage. It was kind of interesting to see that the care and detail that they took into just storing these amazing pieces. The next room we went into was the perfume or fragrance display area. Uh, there were glass shelves with bottles and bottles and bottles of all different labels, different names, different ways to market the Dior fragrance. Of course, the very first fragrance called Miss Dior was created in 1947 along with the New Look Ensemble. Christian Dior wanted everything in his showroom to be perfect, so he created a special fragrance that he had sprayed around the room before the ladies came in to look at the clothes. And when a someone, a worker said, what, but what will we call this fragrance? His sister happened to be walking into the room, and one of the 
workers said to her, oh, Miss Dior, bonjour, Miss Dior. And then Christian Dior said, that's what I'm going to call my fragrance, Miss Dior. So it's actually named after his sister. There were many fragrance bottles in that room and one was a even a little glass dog. I can't remember the name of the fragrance, but I just remember being just thrilled by the display cases and the boxes that these perfumes came in. It must be so amazing to come across something like that in your grandmother's attic or a trunk or something that someone had from years and years ago because nowadays we have perfume bottles that sit on our counters and make things pretty, sparkle, but do they really are they really as iconic as those original Dior boxes? Hmm. We took um, the gray, beautiful gray plush carpeting two steps down to the next room, brought us into what looked to me like a closet. It had a center island and drawers to the left and to the right and cubbies and shelves going up to the ceiling. All of it was that beautiful dove gray Dior color with boxes, hat boxes, shoe boxes, handbag boxes, boxes and boxes and boxes. And inside these boxes were the most beautiful treasures. It was like Aladdin's cave. I mean, this whole experience was like being in Aladdin's cave, but this was really like, I guess I would say Christmas morning when you have a, a, a pile of unopened boxes in front of you and you just don't know where to start first. Swazik said she would open anything. What did I want to see? So we started opening some drawers in the center island and contained in there, beautifully preserved in their foam rubber cases, were jewelry, costume jewelry from the House of Dior, necklaces and bracelets and pins that sparkled and were so gorgeous. And I wanted to touch and try on every single one of them, but I, I just looked. Um, uh, behind me, there were drawers with accessories like gloves and furs and stockings. There was a hat box on every other shelf. And I know that inside were classic hats from the 1950s, 1960s. Um, and even 1980s and 90s hats became popular, a popular accessory. Swazik pulled out a shoe box and in it was a pair of red velvet house slippers. The red wasn't a bright Christmas red, it was more of a burgundy red. But she told us that these exact slippers, this pair was donated to the museum, to the archives, by the estate of the Duchess of Windsor. So Wallace Simpson had ordered and probably worn these slippers at one time. Um, I'm sure she's not the kind of lady that wore the same slippers every day like I do, but um, she had these beautiful red velvet Dior house slippers that she had worn once or twice and her, her staff had preserved and when she passed, they donated them back to the house of Dior. So I was very excited to see these little slippers that were such a piece of fashion history. We saw a handbag that was just a pretty nondescript little box lady bag, I think we could call it. And it with a, a, a flap over it with the latch on it had a CD on, on it, which you don't see very often nowadays. But the CD, Swazik told me, was unique to only Christian Dior. He, the handbags that he designed had this special CD on them, and none of the other do designers have brought that back. So if you see that little CD, that means it's a Christian Dior original. That was very cool, beautiful little handbag. This room of accessories and small leather goods was just, just a wonder and so beautiful to be in. But we had to travel on to our next space, which was the place where they keep all of the amazing clothes. The last room that we went into was a storage facility. It was very clean and kind of like 
a back room of any store that you've seen where they had rows and rows and rows of hanging facilities all set up on a moving rack where you spun the wheel kind of like a, a wheel on a, on a boat. You spun the wheel and the, the closet space moved left or right so that they could all be pressed together for more storage or spaced out so you could get down each row. And Swazik took us down the very first row, which was, of course, the row where they ke kept all of the Christian Dior pieces. That's mostly what I wanted to see. When, If and when I ever get a chance to go back, I will definitely be ready to ask her for the other designers. But at that point in time, all I wanted to see was Christian Dior. So on the hanging racks were our big muslin storage bags and the bags when i say big i mean they're probably they're box like because you don't store these museum quality pieces just hanging anywhere you have to fill them with shoulder pads and bust fill out the bust and and make sure that the pressure on hanging the garment isn't too much of a strain on the garment itself. So each one of these hanging bags was probably about 12 or 14 inches wide. And then just like something you'd see in anyone's closet that held a precious garment, it zipped up the side and had a picture of what was contained inside. The dress that we pulled out first was a black, blue black evening gown, taffeta evening gown. It was strapless and had a small detail of flowers and silk flowers and rhinestones and just a beautiful classic little black dress from Christian Dior. To the side of the hanging racks were, again, shelves and shelves and shelves of boxes. And inside these boxes were dresses that couldn't be hung. They, the first dress that we pulled out was a, a, a strapless gown that, that was uh, supported by foam and tissue paper, acid-free tissue paper, and all the things that made it look kind of like a little doll just lying in this big box, but the dress was taffeta with flowers and embroidery and it was just stunning. Of course, the waist was probably 12 inches, which teeny tiny, but of course, don't forget that back in the 1940s, women wore foundation undergarments that really pulled you in and pushed you out in all the right places. At the far end of this storage room was a sort of library, not as luxurious as the first library that we walked into, but it was the place where they held all of the notebooks. Most amazingly, the notebooks that Christian Dior and all the other designers since Dior have used are stored in this facility. So Swazik pulled out this old black notebook that looked like it had been used and used and used again. And when she opened the book, it was filled with a grid of drawings, a list of materials and prices. This was Christian Dior's first book from his very first collection that had each of the artist's drawings what kind of materials they use to create this piece and how much each one costs to make. And so it was sort of his order book. He took it around with him when he met with his clients. And when someone said, oh, I just adore look number 22, what other materials does this come in? How can we alter it to make it mine? And how much will it all cost? And maybe they didn't ask how much it would cost, but he knew. And that's the idea of couture. When you see something ready to wear on the rack and you try it on, 
maybe it fits, maybe it doesn't fit. That's one thing that's ready to wear. But when you order a couture piece, you walk into the designer, you see what the designer has offered as samples, and then you create your own piece that fits your body to your exact measurements. That's couture. Um, anything from Christian Dior that's couture is just so special nowadays, so precious. And to see this book with his first ideas was amazing. Another final thing that Swazik showed us was a little brochure that Dior had created for one of his following collections. And it was kind of a mini Sears catalog, if you will. And at the back of the book, it said, if you would like to order any of these pieces, we can send them to you at no cost. And we, like Swazik, had a little grin on her face saying that Christian Dior created the first um, online shopping experience. You could look at the book and then call the, the design house and say, I would like to order this. That's the opposite of couture and made to measure, but it's very similar to what we can find in online shopping today. Kind of funny. So that concluded my visit to the archives of Dior. I went back into the library, looked around one last time, gathered my coat, and walked out of that amazing space with just a, a, a wonderment, a, an attitude of disbelief that I got to see this. It's, it was just crazy. I'm so grateful to all the people who made that happen especially my friends at the Dior Boutique here in Atlanta. They are just so wonderful to me, and I just can't believe I'm so lucky to, to be a part of their world. So thank you to them. Um, thank you to Dior. Thank you to Swazik. Thank you to everyone who made this experience possible. And I hope that someday, if you're willing and want to go to Paris with me, I can create the same kind of experience for you. Who knows, maybe I can take you into the archives of Dior. Thanks so much for listening to my podcast today. I appreciate you taking the time to spend a little cafe with Grace. Thank you for joining us at the Cafe with Grace. If you want to know more about finding hidden gems, go to hiddengemswithgrace.com and subscribe to our newsletter or join us on our next trip as we explore more hidden gems with Grace.